most deep impact on my life. My mother has had the deepest impact on my life until today. She was not sentimental, she was not soft, but she had this tremendous capacity to live for other people. Oh, I didn't match the expectations of my mother. I was a very wild child. We had a cat, and when the cat went up to the curtains tearing the silk, my mother put the cat in the black cupboard. And after five minutes she came back to see whether the cat behaved nice, a suffering shrieking came out from the cupboard. My mother let her out and gave her a sausage. And when I did something, nothing would help other than putting me in the black cupboard. And when she asked if I was a nice boy again, she could only hear as I growled. My stubbornness, of course, has stayed in my life, and my wife can witness it. But on the other hand, without the stubbornness, it would have been difficult to spend five years at war. It requires certain stubbornness. This is um, Gustav Gabriel Hellström. He was a minister, but he was also a brilliant scientist, a professor of physics in Åbo. And uh, he was raised to nobility by Tsar Nikolai I. And this is the family weapon, or the, yeah. Uh, and you see those in the house of nobility in Helsinki on the wall, the different nobility families. And Emil of Hellström was his grandson. He was an, a scientist himself, a teacher. His daughter, Elena of Hellström, who is Paul's mother, she writes in her papers as, Father is the best teacher I know. Here are the two portraits of Paul, and he's exactly two years younger, his brother, younger brother life. They are born on the same day with two years between them. Paul is the tough one and life is the very, very sensitive one. Not that Paul isn't sensitive too, but anyway. They um, were good friends, but rather different. Life died when he was about 30 and that was of course a, a blow, especially to the father. He, the, Paul's father and life were very close. And then came 18, 1918 with the catastrophe. So when the, these troops, the red troops came in to shoot her father, she just stood in front of him and said, uh, you don't divide father and daughter. And they got so kind of confused that they simply left the room and went and shot her brother instead. This estate goes back to the 15th or 16th century. This lovely oak tree road here goes down to the lake and then up to the farm. The trees themselves were planted by Elena's sister Sointi, who worked on the farm with the farm workers. And she planted these trees about 1910, I believe. So they are 100 years old. But as you know, that's nothing in the life Oh, an oak tree.
When we went to the war in December 1939, there was no panic, no special fear. I just felt that this is what we must do. I had just been sent to the unit in Lapland and did not know really anybody at all. There was quite a lot of fire around us all the time. Then suddenly the message came that forward observation officer had been wounded and incapable of doing anything. And in the night I was sent to the firing battery. I had one fellow with me, the messenger. After six kilometers through the dark forest we arrived to a place where the Russian battery stood, conquered by the Finns. The Russian had retreated the day before. There was the line now. There were two officers. The first officer was the firing leader and I was the second one. Then suddenly colossal offensive of the Russians started. I remember that the fire was so intense that we could not distinguish a single shot. Like ten thousands of them were firing at the same time. I had never heard this in my life. The bullets were flying so low that we lay in the forest with our cheek to the ground and we couldn't even lift our head. We were lying on the very place where the Russians had their toilet in the midst of Russian instruments. It rained all the time so the earth was covered with that soft brown layer and we were lying in it. I felt that my mother was praying for me all the time. I wrote on a piece of paper from my little notebook, with my hand stretched out. Trust the Lord. Put your trust in the Lord. I wanted this to be my last greetings to my family. Then suddenly this colossal shooting stopped for a while and became sporadic and then it was interrupted by light mortars, like hand grenades, only shot from a hundred meter distance. They were falling around me and my little group. My mouth was filled with gunpowder and clay all the time. My first officer and I were unaware what happened to our group, so he lifted his head just a little and shouted, Boys, spread out, we are too good a goal. And just after that he cried, Oh Satan! And suddenly fell back. His blood was streaming out. He was dead. This is just one example. And there were about 12 such incidents where I was very unlikely to survive. Well, I feel that, I feel that it's, a, it's a tremendous lack in a person tremendous lack who cannot think of other alternatives than the war. Think of other than it war. is such an immaturity of people. And it's, a immaturity. It's, it's not an inevitable, inevitable thing. It's, it's not thing. inevitable at all. I was about 15 years old. I remember this time quite well. Mont Repos seemed like a Venetian landscape in Finland, small Karelian islands and chapels. Talking about childhood, I think of various people, but especially of colossal impact that Paul Nikolai made on me. Nikolai's faith and simplicity had a tremendous impact on my uncle, my mother, and it also affected me. I could see that there was something great in them. I can think of some other people, but at this stage, from the time I was four, the name of Nikolai was very often mentioned in our house. One of the key thoughts of Nikolai when he traveled to Finland and to Eastern Europe, Hungary, was the question, what are you living for? This thought went to the heart of the problem 
Because as I mentioned, at this time there was a colossal emptiness and crisis among the students in Russia. Many students ended their lives by suicide. And Nikolai directly addressed this problem, not taking the students into some new movement, but helping them to change their own hearts, to get the courage to start changes, not with someone else, but with themselves. And he asked the students to read the Sermon on the Mount. He used to say that the Sermon on the Mount was like a mirror, and if you're honest enough and courageous, you'll see in the mirror exactly what you are like. And then it's up to you whether you want to accept it and just continue to live the same way or you want to change. I need to get the right color, that was my problem. I was just fascinated with uh, its beauty, calm and peaceful beauty, which was different than other art somehow. There's some, there was some additional quality there. I wanted to find out what it was. Um, so that, this is the thing about icons, that you get the impressions through your eyes and your heart not only through your brain. I was told by a Swedish famous painter that whatever you have in your heart comes out in the painter painting, even if you paint watercolor, you know, aquarel. They have understood that, the, those old masters of icons. Painting icons doesn't make sense, and, and icon experts can be very stubborn and think they know everything best. Also, if they are Russian, you know, I mean, so, so I mean, that's no... <laughs> They're human beings, we're all human beings, whether we're icon painters or not. This one, this painting, which, um, which is a traditional painting of Whitson, Pentecost. Disciples were different personalities. They were free to be themselves, but they have the common purpose and a common inspiration. Each one had his own conviction. And they had been tested through difficult things, and they had discovered, you know, that it's one thing to have high ideals in faith, but those ideals don't change the price of cheese if they are not reality in your personality. And that takes some time. And the sun, of course, the blue sun, strangely, blue, why? Well, that's how the icons do it. There are 12 different beams of inspiration, one for each disciple, and they have a high, very big aim. So to me, it's a comfort to know that in the basis of Russian culture is this, this humility that no nation can do it alone. No nation is sovereign, you know. Oh, 
My brother also spent three years in the war and took part in the great battle near Viborg in 1944. He returned from the war alive, but he was a very sensitive person by nature, and it had affected him very much indeed. After the war I did not keep my heart open, I did not think of how I could help my brother. And this is one of the biggest mistakes I've made in my life. Once I was in France, I got the idea to write a letter to my brother. Not to tell him in general what I have done, but let him know where I have failed. I failed to be what I should be. I failed to be a brother. Then came the thought that let him know not in general what you Shortly done, after that he suddenly died. Let him know my mother later told failed. me that he had been greatly well, touched failed. by this letter. I never saw him after failed this until his death. But, but my mother said that after this letter he found a new inner peace in his life. My mother tells him, tells me that he had been Yeah, it was one of these unexpected happenings in life. I met Paul as well, but he he made quite an impression on me because he uh, his eyes were so lively, you know, and and I, I took a liking into him and, and all the other fellows there. And Mr. Paul Gunderson, he has been a family friend for 60 years. Mr. Gunderson was the starter of my life in a very different direction. Honesty, unselfishness, love and purity. If you want to change the world, the best place is to start with yourself. But I changed my own life the um, uh, and many of my friends were influenced by my change. And uh, in that way, I changed a small part of the world. My thoughts were not concentrated anymore, all the time around such questions as am I happy, am I doing well, am I successful? But I began to look at those around me and near me. What about him? What about my friend here or there? And I saw a lot of people with completely new eyes. I can think of many instances where I should have followed up individual people more, with greater care, 
I should have dedicated more time to them as persons. The world is suffering from a colossal loneliness, and really lonely people do not live somewhere in the deep woods. They are sitting in the boardrooms of big companies. Before I retired, I was working at Nokia. After my retirement, another managing director came to my post, and he had made some wrong decisions. He was totally alone and did not dare to come to someone else to tell he had done mistakes. The problems grew bigger and bigger every day, and one day his whole life had turned into one huge problem. And he took a gun and shot himself. I think my wife may have mentioned Madame Lor, who was the former secretary general of the women's trade union movement of France. She traveled to hundreds of places in Germany to apologize for her hatred to Germans, who had tortured to death her son. The contribution of this woman to the reconciliation between the two countries became a part of history. Similar examples exist in all countries. It may start with the top leaders, but the key is that simple and ordinary people soon get a vision, an idea, a certain momentum to do something, and the movement of reconciliation starts to evolve. There are many examples of different scale of how a personal reconciliation led to reconciliation between parties, groups, minorities, and entire nations. And open the doors to understanding the need for cooperation. The key point is that it wasn't a specific method that mattered, but the living people who dared to take the first step. The Allied Commission got a special permission for Germans who otherwise wouldn't have been allowed to come to Switzerland, and they came there, and many threads of reconciliation, big and small. Started to spread all around Europe, and that was the way the process started, on an increasingly wider basis, and a new thinking and understanding in Europe was born. But all the time behind this process, there were people who dared to look at themselves, not to blame others, and to ask themselves, where do I need to change? An individual person can be a part of a chain that, that leads to new life. If he does not obey, the chain will break, and the world will suffer, and the changes will take much more time. It's always the obedience of an individual that brings forward God's plan. Obedience gives an important meaning to life. You're able to see every person's precious soul. No longer there will be more important or less important people. Every person will be precious.